we thank God for uh, another day to worship and to thank Him. Our call to worship will be just a little bit different. Um, and growing up, my grandmother said this song. Sorry. My grandmother said this song. Growing up, my mother made my children learn this song. So I believe all of you know it, so let's just say it together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He made me to lie down in green pastures. He seated me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, but thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they be comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My God running over. Surely the goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for assuring us that goodness and mercy shall follow us all of our days. That you are always with us and that you will never leave leave us. Now help us to prepare our minds, our hearts for worship. Let us not be distracted. Let us not think about things that we can do nothing about at this moment. Thank you for this day and for being so good. Amen. Amen.
a wonderful singer for that wonderful solo. Holy, holy, holy is our God. Amen. Can you imagine what it would be like to behold him and be in his presence? Y'all think this is Lewis just said. Just imagine being in the presence of the angels and all of the saints in heaven. That multiplied, uh, multiplied times millions and millions. Being in the glorious presence of our great God. Amen. Amen. God is holy, holy, holy. Just thinking and basking in the, the glorious presence of God even now. Hallelujah. 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 We welcome our online family to Westminster Presbyterian Church. Thank you for joining us in worship today. For all of our family who are gathered here to worship, we praise God for your presence. God is so worthy to be praised. As I look around the room, I see our uh, freshman, uh, from, oh, sorry, sophomore, <laughs> Kennedy. I'm glad to see you, Kennedy. She's back on TSU. We praise God for the completion of that. First year of college and now sophomore. I see mama raising her hands in praise. Amen. Amen. Thank God for you and how God is blessing you in your, your school year. All our church family, thank God for your presence for all over here. God is so good, amen, and worthy amen. to be praised. I invite you to join me in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6. We'll be sharing God's word for the passage of scripture. Romans chapter 6. Verse 4 is our key verse, but I want to read verse 1 through 4 in our hearing. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. And the Word of God reads, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. A new life. Because he lives, I have new life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit abiding with us, for your sweet presence with us even now in this moment of worship. We ask, O oh God, that you'll speak afresh to us through your holy word. Strengthen each believer, and God, if there's anyone who does not know you as Lord and Savior, use this preaching time to draw them into savoring relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Paul, in these verses of scripture that I read, starts off with a rhetorical question in some way. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's speaking to believers. He's speaking to followers in Jesus Christ. He's asking them a question. Shall you keep on sinning? Keep on doing things that are contrary to the will and purpose of God? And the answer is a resounding no. God forbid. And emphasize in old King James. And this idea, this concept, is important for this fact, he says, because you have died to sin. You're dead to sin. And he goes on giving this image, this picture, that was something that the people of that day knew of. Coming from the old Jewish tradition, when those who came into the faith, and when they would go through ceremonial washings, they would go to the mikvah, the, the baptismal, purpose to, one, represent their cleansing, and the newness in their walk. Paul, as all believers of that day, following the instructions of uh, 
John the Baptist and of Jesus, they would be baptized as a symbol of their new life, dying to sin, being emerged in the water, representing the death to sin, and coming up from the water, the representation of the new life. It is the idea that was painted in that baptismal image, the idea of death to sin's control, and being raised up to live in the newness of life. Since we have died to sin's control, Paul emphasized, we can't keep on living the same sinful life because it is in direct contradiction to the reality of our newness. Paul speaks to the church of Corinth in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He says, therefore, if anyone in, this, is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has now come. In his teachings in the book of Romans, as well as in, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul emphasized that we are to put off the old man, the old woman, and put on the new man or new woman. That the reality, as followers of Jesus Christ, our life in Christ has now become new. And the resurrection of Christ, because he lives, you and I are able to live this new life in Jesus Christ. We're able to put off the old man, the old woman, and now put on the new man and new woman to walk in the fullness of the calling that God has for us. For our Lord and Savior said that he came to give us life and life more abundantly. And that's part of the new life that we have received in our walk with Jesus Christ. It first happens, this, this walk in new life, because our life now has experienced this one thing first, that sin, life has been severed. The sin life has been severed. The grip of sin has now been severed. Sin's grip that once had a hold on us, where, speaking the language of Paul, that we were dead in trespasses and sins, which paints this picture that we were out of control and that sin held us tight and drug us wherever sin wanted to take us. We were led away by the lust of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, and the pride of life. We were drugged. We were following sin's pull and tug with willful surrender. But the moment the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us, now we have a tug of war. Not being drugged, but there's a pulling back and forth. Where God says he wants you to go, the Spirit is pulling you this way. But the old man, old woman says go this way. Before Christ's spirit came into what we in, we were just being drunk. But now there's a tug of war. And your obedience and my obedience causes the pull of God to become real when we yield and say yes to his control. The spirit gives us the power to Follow the pull of God. Your willful obedience to him assures that the winning of the tug of war goes towards the will of God. Because now sin's control has been severed by the entrance of the power of God into your life. Paul says we are dead to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Sin's grip. Sin's grip. I, I was thinking as I was meditating on this sermon. Our reality is uh, we have uh, some of those sinful um, 
urges and desire. Again, the tug of war is still going on. Sometimes we we allow sin to pull us one way. I remember myself. I, I, I did not always have a clean mouth. And if you push me the wrong way right now, something might slip. The spirit is not feeling the control. I'm being real, I'm being honest. But I guarantee you, 18 year olds wrong is much different than 52 year olds wrong. Because there was, I would say it, I would let it come out. Yeah, it would come out. <laughs> <laughs> I recall as I was thinking, don't move on from me. But I was, I was preaching, it's the early years of preaching, but I was also, and that's now I'm a school teacher. I was playing basketball, I was young. Man. With my students, I took off my my shirt and I was on my t-shirt playing basketball on the court. This is in Albuquerque. One of the little young men got his finger cut some kind of way, and he walked over to me and wiped his bloody finger on my t-shirt. And I said some things that I shouldn't have said. And a young man who was in the office, who was, who was playing, who actually wiped the blood on my shirt, his response was. Ooh, Reverend Bell cuts. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't pray like God help me. Because I'm always going to deal with this inside of me. And there will be people around me proverbially wiping their bloody finger on me. Help me to control this tongue so that I won't speak out of your character. And I thank God. I, I'm, I'm, in jail, I'm, I'm in jail every day of the week, Monday through Friday, with young men who I teach. And I get called everything but a child of God. Uh, several times. Not, it's not as bad as it was the first few weeks of teaching. They, they understand that. But occasionally they say some stuff. But by the grace of God, and him working on my tongue, he keeps it under control. And keeps peace, and they see that in me. Versus 20 some year old Jerome, who in his flesh followed the pool of sin and he allowed it to flow in a way that would represent him in a way that's not pleasing to God. So, so the reality is we have the propensity to sin within. But as Christ's Spirit controls us, as we yield in prayer, he's able to harness the actions that don't reflect being part of the new creation. A new man, a new woman. And I want you to understand that, that our prayer to God is so that the Holy Spirit will quicken us in moments when we can act out of God's character. We all can do it. But our prayer life our talking to God activates the spirit in us to give us strength to stand and represent him as the new creation in Christ Jesus. So the new life in Christ is a sin severed life. Second, the new life in Christ is abundant life. Jesus said these words in John 10.10. 10, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. And I know in our culture today, where we live in a capitalistic society and, and our Christianity is due to those capitalistic terms and thoughts, we think that that means that God has come to make me rich, wealthy. Well, God's not just concerned about dead presidents and your crib and what type of crib you got and all this stuff. Because you can have all the money in the world, but no peace in your heart. You can have the finest sort of mattress and can't sleep. God works in those areas, and I like to give us abundant life because it's an internal job. Not the externals. It's internal. He works on the heart. He works on inside, giving us peace within. He gives us his love that flows in and out. 
can wear our nice suits and look wonderful in our dresses, but on the inside be a wreck and a mess. Hateful, uncompassionate. But God comes to do an inside work so that the abundant life is first felt within us. That the peace of God controls our heart. That the calm of God keeps us in situations where others are losing their minds. New life in Christ is abundant life. And yes, God promises to meet our needs according to his riches and glory. And God will bless us as faithful stewards to have some of the finer things in life. But that is not the sum of abundant life. It's a life that's rooted in Christ and Christ's spirit living in you, giving you the joy, peace, righteousness of the Holy Ghost within. And that is what God wants us to have as believers. He wants that life of abundance to be seen in the way we live, the way we give, the way we interact with our family and friends, so they say uh, of you, that's a loving brother, a loving sister, a kind, compassionate sister, a brother, that their abundant life is seen in our relationships. Jesus said that people will know that we are his disciples by our our big houses and cars? No, by our love. By our love. And that's the true sign of new life in Christ and abundant life when the love of God is seen and manifested and flowing from our lives. New life in Christ is a sin separate life. New life in Christ is abundant life, but finally new life in Christ is eternal life. Eternal life. The Savior's grip on our lives allows us and gives us the guarantee that we will spend eternity in the sanctuary of God forever. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life. Eternal life. Paul spoke about the, uh, shall we continue in sin, that, that grace may abound, God forbid. Sin's end is death. For the wage of sin is death. Separation from the presence and power and the love of God forever. But with our relationship with Christ, he brings us into a place of peace and forgiveness so that our sins are covered by his blood, reconciling us to God so that we're able to experience life and not death. Life in the sense of a unbroken fellowship with God that starts here the moment that you and I come into a relationship with God, we're connected. We're in the palm and the hand of God and no one can pluck us out. And the peace of God comes and dwells within the person of the Holy Spirit that keeps us and empowers us to live a life of obedience to God. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took our sins upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus did that on the cross. He took all of sin, that which leads to death, on the cross, on himself, for you and for me. And for all of humanity who are willing to put their faith in him, he took the brunt of God's wrath and experienced it all on the cross. That God, even in himself, said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he took all of guilt, shame, and 
and, and grip of sin upon himself on the cross took it all. The wrath of God and that moment of separation from God, he took it in order to bring us into relationship to experience life and not death. Eternal life in Christ is not just by and by in the sky. It's here and now experiencing the power and abundant life that Christ offers for you and for me. It's right now knowing that there is nothing that can separate me from the love of God. There's nothing that can separate me from his power and his presence. Wherever I am, he's there with me. I can cry out to him and he hears and he responds to me. That's prayer. And I can talk to the one that said, let there be and everything that was not came into existence and he speaks to me. Little old me when he created all the worlds, the universes, and he created everything. But I am able to have a personal conversation because he is my father, my savior. In my eternal life, the security that I have right now is that which will keep me forever and forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And you keep on adding some more evers after that. <laughs> Eternal life. That I'm secure in his holy presence. And the moment that I transition from this world, I'm in his presence. Welcome into his presence. As his beloved son, as his beloved daughter, he welcomes us. And what a blessed assurance to live each day, no matter what I face, no matter what I go through, that the reality is I am with Christ. And Christ is with me. And we are connected forever, and he welcomes me. And as we come to this table later today to, to celebrate communion, it is a reminder that we are welcome to the table. With loving arms, Christ welcomes us because he paid the price by shedding his blood, which represents uh, in the wine that we would drink, in the cup that we would drink from. And his body was broken, the bread which we would eat. He opened wide his arms, stretching them out on Calvary as an invitation to all for eternal life through Christ. Father, we thank you for new life through Jesus Christ. We thank you that you died on the cross, you were laid in the borrowed tomb, and on the third day you rose with all power in your hands so that we who put our faith in you can die to sin's control and be raised fresh to walk in new life today by your power. Thank you for new life in Christ. And God, I pray that as we are listening to your voice now, that every believer under the sound of my voice surrenders their life to you in obedience to experience the fullness of your power today. Power over sin's control in their life. Power to walk in the abundant life. And the power to rest in the assurance they have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Strengthen each believer in their walk with you. Allow their lives to represent you in every aspect. And Father, if there's anyone who does not know you as Lord and Savior, Use this moment now to draw them into fellowship with you so they will experience new life with the old will pass away and behold that all things will become new in their life because of Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
For every believer who is gathered here in the sanctuary, Christ has come to give you new life. There's areas in your life where you want those dead things to be put away. Even now, pray and ask God to give you strength. Confess those things to Him and say, Today, by your power, O oh God, I'm going to walk in the news that you've given me in the person of the Holy Spirit. New life is yours. If there's anyone who is not a believer in Christ, we offer Christ to you. Come and give your life to Jesus Christ. This is a moment where you can give your heart to him, and he will come and sup with you. He will allow you to experience newness in your life. As the choir is leading us in the invitation song, glory, glory, hallelujah. We offer Christ to you. Come now.
took that season of Passover and gave it a new meaning for them, connecting what was for them a normal celebration to something that was to be a life-changing event for the entire world. They would normally take bread in the time of Passover, but Jesus took it and, and he said this was his body that was broken for them. And he took the cup, which was normally part of their celebration, the wine, and he gave it new meaning. He said, this was my blood that is shed for you. Allowing them to see but what was going to occur in the forecoming days that his death on the cross was to connect for them the meaning of the Passover lamb in a new way. That he was that lamb. His blood was to be shed for the covering of their sins. Just as the blood was put on the doorposts and the death angel passed over. And all of those who were in the house, they did not experience the death because of the blood. As believers in Jesus Christ, his blood covers us. Not only are we able or exempt from death, we're given eternal life, but we're given a new found connection and relationship with God. Abundant life. To have communion with God and fellowship with God. To walk and talk with Him in a place of intimacy and closeness. To be around the table. Welcome. <clears throat> and as we come to the table, we even now confess our sins. We ask God to forgive us for things that we have done that are wrong, or things that we have neglected to do that He's called us to fulfill so that we can come to the table with a clean and pure heart. So even now, take a moment and confess anything that will separate you, keep you distant from God. Forgive us, O oh God, and cleanse us afresh as we come to this table tonight. Lord, we bless this bread that represents your body that was broken the cup which symbolizes your blood that was shed for, for us on our behalf. And God, we come with hearts of gratitude to be able to commune with you. So bless our time of communion with one another as we celebrate the life of Christ in a new life that we have in him. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
took the bread and he broke it. This is my body that is broken for you. Eat. Y'all with it. He took the cup. He said, drink this. This is my blood that is shed for the remission of sin. Drink you all of it together. If there are no other verbal questions to share, let's, let's go to God in prayer. I pray, God, we glorify you, we magnify you, we thank you for this precious privilege and opportunity to give us to come in your presence in prayer. God, you are a holy God and worthy God of all our prayers. God, we thank you for the beauty of this day and how you've drawn us to come together in the house of worship on this first Sunday of May. We recognize, God, it's been your grace that has kept us and sustained us, watched over us and provided for us, and brought us here together today to worship you. And we worship you because you are worthy. We worship you because your spirit has enlivened us to recognize that you are worthy, that you are holy, that you are our Lord and Savior. So, God, we come together with hearts rejoicing in your presence. We thank you, Father, for how you have blessed us in this moment of worship. We thank you for the life that you've given us. We thank you for new strength, new grace, and new mercy that we are able to experience in the fellowship of believers. Oh, how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to gather together in unity. And we thank you, God, that where you said there are two or three gathered in your name, you're in our midst. And so, God, we know that you are here in a powerful way. In the smiles and the greetings and the handshakes and the songs and the prayers and the word that's shared. God, you are in our midst. And we thank you for your fresh touch. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the love that we are able to share as we cry out together as family on the behalf of those who we have verbally requested prayers for. Father, some who may be experiencing 
sickness in their body. God, we come to you collectively, crying to you for you are the God who is able to heal. We have all power and we trust in your healing and keeping grace for our family and our friends. For those who experience loss in their lives, God, we come to you as the comforter, the one who provides all comfort. Touch hurting and grieving hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we, we come seeking your continued wisdom and direction for the church, for Westminster Presbyterian Church, for those who are in leadership position, for every believer. God, allow us to have a renewed sense of call on our lives, a renewed sense that we have been saved to be your mouthpiece, to be ambassadors for Christ in our families, in our communities, in the workplace, school, wherever we may be, God, empower us and strengthen us to be faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ in word and in deed. Use us, oh God, to be a change agent in this community, in this city, through the labors, through the giving, through the prayers, of these, your saints of Westminster Presbyterian Church. And God, we know that you'll be glorified in all that is said and done on your behalf. So empower us, O oh God, to go forth in your name each and every day. We give your name glory, honor, and praise. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now we'll have our recognition uh, by Elder Christian School. We have had, well, some people sing to you, some people sing for you, when you sing through us. <laughs> so Amen. thank you for that. Amen. And Reverend Bell, you preached a, a wonderful word. And we appreciate you and the gifts that you bring. But also, an obligation of worship is to give. So please uh, drop your offering in the envelopes in the, back, in the offering place in the back. Or for those who are online, or even if you're in the sanctuary this morning, you can give your tithes and offerings electronically. Uh, happy birthday, May Sullivan. They are listed in the bulletin. Um, one particular birthday that I'm very proud of, the proud of today. And I'm also proud that that little birthday celebrant has a, an internship this summer at Altec Industries and the distribution plant as a, a mini engineer ish. <laughs> she will be earning her own money this summer. <laughs> <laughs> we have another TSU Big Blue graduate, Eric, is home. Hey, Eric. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting to see how our circles keep it. So, uh, let's see. We will be preparing for graduation Sunday in June. Is that correct? More details to come. I know there's one particular graduate's mother, I won't name, who is sitting in the choir. Mother's Day is hat day. Take out your hats and let's have a tea party on next Sunday. We will be in the sanctuary next Sunday. Uh, at 11 a.m. The flowers, the beautiful flowers, uh, if you want to know, have been donated by Jefferson State Community College. That person who works at Jeff State may or may not be sitting in the sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> and we will distribute those after church. Okay, so don't make a mad rush. We will give those out uh, after church today. Matthew 25, food giveaway, I believe the um, festival will be rescheduled, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. We don't have a date that that right? Um, yes, we have reserved equipment for um, all, of, all of our rooms, but we have not approved it, so I won't okay. announce it okay. yet. <laughs> As a good Presbyterian, we will wait until it's been voted on. Okay. But the Matthew 25 food giveaway has been rescheduled for Thursday. On Thursday, May 18th, 2 until 4 p.m. Thursday, May 18th, 2 until 4 p.m. Are there other announcements? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
thank God for everyone who's here. And everyone for your presence. For there it is, good to see you, brother. Thank you for your presence with us. And it's so wonderful to see everyone who's here today. God is so good, amen, and worthy to be praised. Pray you have a wonderful week. Let us stand uh, as we have our closing hymn, We'll Go With God. And then our benediction.